Hello. Yeah, very pleased to be here. Can you all see me and hear me? Uh, I hope you can. <laughs> Um, yes, uh, as Jeremy has mentioned, uh, we've been pretty active in Risk Five and uh, um, around Risk Five, I guess. A lot of the work we've done uh, for, revolves somewhere around, you know, machine learning. So I think it'll be a great time to the next presentation as well. Uh, but yep, let me just kind of go through my slides. Um, today I'll be talking about how do you develop and test machine learning on small microcontrollers uh, in Risk Five and in FPGA, and sometimes both. Uh, so, uh, starting quickly with who we are, uh, my company, which I indeed co-founded uh, over 10 years ago, is building open source of various kinds. We help people build products, and uh, building those products, we tend to use new methodologies and open source-based you know, tooling, uh, everything that we can, we want to have full control of to be able to, to modify it. Uh, so, small wonder we, we like open source so much. We're part of uh, uh, both Risk Five International, of course, a founding member, but also Linux Foundation's effort project, Chips Alliance, and Open Power. Uh, and everywhere we try to kind of play a leading role in, in convincing people that doing things in the open is just uh, the good way to do it. Um, if you want to see more about what we do, you know, there's, there's this technology showcase we have on our main website. You can take a look. There's a bunch of, you know, blog notes uh, that you can kind of get a better feeling of uh, uh, the breadth of, of the things we do. You can see some of it here. And in general, it's hardware, software, AI stuff, FPGAs and ASICs, as well as tooling. And tooling is what I'm focusing on today. Um, Tiny machine learning, I won't be introducing the topic in great detail. Uh, many of you probably know what it is, kind of putting machine learning on very small microcontrollers. Uh, there's a huge amount of opportunities uh, there because, of course, having ML run everywhere enhances you know, privacy and security and, and, generally speaking, gives a lot of low latency uh, uh, intelligence all around us. So, so kind of do be useful to have machine learning going on in, in various small devices that can be battery powered. But of course, this introduces a lot of challenges. And those are uh, around, of course, constraints mm -hmm. that those devices have, uh, as well as uh, more general stuff that concerns, I think, all sorts of IoT and, and uh, embedded and edge development, which is you know the difficulty in sources, sourcing hardware felt particularly now in this period. Um, the the difficulty in testing at scale because you know repeatability and determinism also kind of suffers. Um, you know the ability to configure things differently and and check complex systems against various corner cases. This is uh, generally speaking um, possible to do, but so hard that people mostly avoid it as much as they can. And so those kind of systems traditionally don't really get tested very well. And if you if you put the complexity of machine learning on top of all that, uh, then of course uh, it becomes pretty challenging and, and uh, small wonder that this domain is pretty young and fresh and, and still in development. And those challenges have to be overcome. So yeah, um, we're kind of claiming that Renode an open source simulation framework that we're building can help in this. And uh, uh, there's a few examples I'd be going through today um, that'll hopefully show you how, how Renode can be of help. Uh, there's people like Google, Microchip, ARM, and QuickLogic using them. Uh, more specifically, the Google TensorFlow Lite team is using Renode for, for testing their machine learning stuff. So uh, I think that's the most relevant one to talk about today. Uh, but so is ARM, for example. And uh, in case uh, you were thinking, hmm, does Renode make any sense in the FPGA context? You know, we have the, the microchip FPGA people as well as QuickLogic, uh, which is also an FPGA company, working with us very closely around these kind of use cases. Uh, okay, so Renode, it's a simulator. It's something for developing IoT products. And uh, we developed it, uh, we started 2010, so many years ago, almost at the very beginning of the company. We created the tool because we felt, yeah, this is this is good, the right thing to do. This is a tool that we really need. And uh, uh, then we always had this idea that we might open source it because it just felt like the right thing to do. But we never actually did that until 2015. And that was, of course, the best thing to happen to us. Uh, um, well. Uh, tied with Risk Five, perhaps, which was approximately a similar timeline. Also, so Risk Five, the foundation, was created uh, approximately around that time time frame, 
Uh, and so in 2020, we have all those users I mentioned, and like Amazon and Microsoft is not on the list here, but they're also using it. Um, there's there's quite a lot of people uh, using Renault and working with us to improve it. Uh, we mostly foresaw this IoT development use case initially when we were creating it, but it turns out that it's useful for many other things like architecture exploration and you know pre-silicon prototyping, hardware software co-development, um, and all of these things are fine. Like we we want Reno to do all of those things. Um, and we're very happy that the flexibility allows people to target use cases that we might have not come up with before. Um, and uh, how it works and why it's possible in the first place is uh, we have those you know plug and play building block approach where all of the IPs and, and parts of the SOC these are just building blocks that can put together. Uh, we come with a lot of demos and, and binaries to get started, um, and also we kind of underline it very heavily. This is a software agnostic framework. So even though I'll be talking about like TensorFlow like Micro and Zephyr and other kinds of software today, this is not to say that you couldn't use Zephyr uh, Renode with anything, even proprietary software if you want. Um, of course, we typically uh, work with open source because it's just so much easier to like debug and uh, develop. But admittedly, of course, many of our customers have their own like end applications that they don't necessarily want to open up. This is fine. Like, it's just a tool. Uh, it, it kind of uh, corresponds to what the hardware would do. So it will run your software, whatever your software is. And uh, we always tend to talk about this, that it's, it's continuous integration oriented. It's meant to be used for automating flows and, and working with CI tools. And you can also test protocol stacks, which is uh, not what I will be talking about today, but this is very useful in combination with all the other things because it's not just for seeing whether your single device works, but it's, it's also going out into the area of multi-node and, and protocols and so on. Um, as I mentioned, there's uh, this, this didn't export very well, but uh, uh, basically there's you know three contexts. Uh, yeah, it's a simplification, of course, but many people when they think simulators, they think oh like this can simulate like an SOC, which yes it can, but uh, uh, we also look at the the broader uh, scope of this. So we simulate entire boards, and then we can also simulate systems of boards connected into one IoT system. And, and I think that uh, this uh, broad focus helps a lot because a lot of the, the application development actually appears uh, when people get hold of real boards and, and, and connect them together and try to build a real machine learning application. Uh, so the, 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 the kind of vendor oriented approach or the semiconductor company oriented approach where, where the SOC is what's important. Uh, this is of course uh, uh, very important to have in mind because there's a lot of important use cases there. Uh, but we also feel that uh, uh, many challenges are created somewhere when someone takes something that theoretically should work and then puts it in practice and it turns out, okay, it, it doesn't. Uh, and that's because you know they use the wrong sensor or, or whatever the reason. Very typically, it's just a small bug. <laughs> and, and that's the kind of stuff we want to help people uh, fight with. Uh, Important thing to mention too is you know kind of the peripherals and sensors that uh, um, yeah, feed the data into your device, right? So if you want to do machine learning, you need data, and we can actually input that data into the the simulation via various means. Uh, we can simulate those uh, you know humidity meters and thermometers and accelerometers and microphones and even cameras since recently, uh, and so you can pass. Simulated data or even real data into Renode and take a look at what what's going on, uh, how how your virtual algorithm actually works in practice. We have this platform description format, and and that's a, a human readable format that helps you build platforms. It's modular and extendable, and allows you to use Renode without having to code. I mean, if you want to do really serious stuff, you'll have to code at the end. You'll have to add something. But if you just want to put together a platform and get your firmware simulator, very often you won't have to resort to actually changing Renode. You'll just have to write a script. That's that's pretty simple to do. You can just look at a lot of examples and just copy paste stuff. Um, and uh, that's our focus. Like we want to be user friendly so that people don't necessarily have to go and ask us, okay, how does you know Renode work internally? Like it's it's open source. You can take a look and improve but you don't really need to understand that to, to just use it. And that's what the platform description format is for. If you wanted to get a feeling for like what, what 
does it look like to put together a platform uh, in Linode? Here's an example. It's a very self-contained one, but actually it, it would simulate a binary, right? You, you put together a CPU, a UART, and an interrupt controller, and you could run a, a real world binary on this very concise piece of simulation. Admittedly, it's a very abstract thing. It's actually, this is a soft core, it's my five uh, from micro semi or microchip now. But uh, in general, that's what it looks like. If you want a lot of peripherals, of course, that file will grow much longer, but admittedly, it's also not, not too long. Uh, it's a bit similar to device trees. If like many people ask about that, it's not the same, but it's kind of similar. Um, we can do a lot of FPGA oriented stuff as well. Uh, and that's kind of what today is about a little bit. Uh, we have stuff like co-simulation with uh, Verilator. I mean, Verilator is just an example, but since it's such a, such a popular tool and it's open source, we obviously like it and we integrate with that. Uh, having said that, uh, there is no reason why we shouldn't be able to integrate with other things. And there are plans to integrate with other HDL simulators too. Um, so you can vary later your peripherals, you can connect to various uh, uh, buses, and generally speaking, um, partition your simulation between Renode and a, a HDL simulator. Um, and that's what it would look like if you wanted to kind of uh, connect, you know, Renode to uh, Verilator. We can also co-simulate with physical FPGAs. Here we have a picture of FOMU because that's where we originally implemented this kind of thing. Uh, now, uh, this is actually, of course, going to be possible with other FPGAs too. We're actually working with, uh, um, for example, MicroSemi on kind of implementing more like FPGA co-simulation capabilities. Um, and, and this is pretty interesting because, you know, again, uh, very often people use, you know, those massive FPGAs for prototyping uh, stuff. And uh, being able to like partition that onto, you know, Renode and, and then just focus on the stuff that you really need could potentially get you going in a much smaller FPGA than we'd normally use for the entire SOC. Um, so I think it's a very interesting area, very worth exploring. Uh, and yeah, that's what it would look like if we wanted to, to kind of simulate Renode and physical FPGA. As you can see, there's an Etherbone bridge in the server that, that connects those two. Uh, and some of the peripherals are in Renode and other stuff could be in uh, the FPGA itself. We support a lot of vendors and platforms. I mean, you know, it's an endless task almost to support everything, but we're trying our best. A lot of this development is, of course, driven by customers that we have. Uh, but we've been very lucky with having a lot of diverse customers that sponsor a lot of different interesting developments. Uh, you're probably most interested in the Risk Five stuff because you're here for for Risk Five. So here's a bunch of platforms that we can uh, run on, or not run on, that we can run. Right? Um, there's of course the Sci Five uh, uh, Hyper Unleashed. Uh, actually, the Hyper One as well. It's not on the list. It's only here, but we can simulate it. Uh, this big, massive, you know, uh, Polar Fire so C development platform, as well as the Icicle Kit uh, told, uh, on the extreme right. Um, from from microchip. Uh, there's the Kendrite, there's the Vega board, uh, there's some FPGA platforms. I mean, FPGAs, of course, any FPGA can have a soft S risk five SOC. So like in practice, putting all of the FPGA boards wouldn't make sense here. But we do have like uh, some demos that we know that they work in art on an RT board or on a FOMO board. And these demos can be reproduced one to one in Renode for sure. So, so in that sense, that's why I put them here on this picture. But in practice, of course, if you're just simulating a soft Risk V uh, core, as long as we sim simulate that core, uh, this could be any FPGA board. And there's more. Like there, there's more boards coming. Uh, we're trying to to actually cover you know as much ground in Risk V as we can. And we're very excited with the platform. Uh, some real world usage of Renode, um, of course, um, very exa interesting example is the collaboration of QuickLogic because this is a, a actually an ARM platform, but I'll tell you in the next slide why this matters. This is an FPGA SOC where we're simulating the um, hardcore, uh, but of course, uh, we're also actually building uh, open source tooling for the built-in FPGA on this platform. And obviously it's a great, you know, little board. It's an open hardware board that was launched in cloud, cloud supply. We designed it. Uh, it's uh, basically um, uh, a feather format board with an FPG SOC with Cortex M inside and a multitude of sensors. And so 
basically you could use this to, for any kind of machine learning development and you can get running without uh, the physical hardware because it's uh, working in Renode. And we also did a lot of infrastructure like Zephyr support and so on. Uh, why it matters is that like the next step from that is uh, actually uh, using the same architecture like core plus FPGA, but using RISC-V instead. And uh, together with Clicklogic, we're involved uh, in this project. Uh, it's basically the, the open hardware group actually is, is in charge of this, developing you know the core five MCU as they call it. Uh, which is uh, effectively a similar setup to the EOS S3 that I showed on the previous slide, but using RISC-V, which is of course great because RISC-V is open. And uh, uh, this is uh, also going to support much bigger FPGA. So in total, it's going to be a much more powerful platform. And thanks to that, uh, of course, uh, we'll be able to do much more interesting stuff. Um, Renode will support this platform, actually already supports this platform mostly. Uh, but of course, this is a project in progress, so uh, there's certainly some stuff to to you know polish. But in general, uh, if you want to try this platform, even though it doesn't physically exist because this is just going to be taped out at some point, you can actually get started today. Um, and uh, I think this kind of setup will grow much more popular. FPGAs in general, we're hoping to make them much more popular uh, for both machine learning development and, and in general. Um, and quick logic, you have to remember, these guys do open source tooling. We managed to convince them to get out of Google to do open source FPGA tooling. So if you want to actually program this FPGA, you don't have to learn like some weird vendor specific tooling. You just go and download an open source tool chain called SimbiFlow, and you can program uh, those boards freely, just like you can program the CPU of GCC. Uh, so I think it's a really exciting uh, platform and le really looking forward to this. Um, and the third uh, case that I'll also focus on is, is the Google collaboration that we have around TensorFlow Lite. Basically, uh, I won't walk through the entire story perhaps, but uh, and just to uh, um, say, you know, it's, it's a long story where we started, you know, years ago, just did a little bit of work and then gradually, gradually we got to at the point where we are today, where we're doing quite a lot of work together. And what brought us together in the first place was actually RISC-V running on an FPGA and um, simulating that in Renode. We did this uh, tiny metal demo uh, where we could do uh, TF Lite running inside the Zephyr RTOS um, and doing like gesture recognition. Uh, and originally it was an RT board that we then kind of made it work on Renode 2. And the, the demo looked like this, you know, you had gestures that uh, you were supposed to detect and we fed like artificial data into Renode and detect the gestures. It was pretty exciting, of course, and still is, but uh, we, we went quite a long way from there. Um, there's also uh, the education use case, which is, is really, really growing on us. It's, it's, I mean, not growing on us, but in front of our eyes in a sense. We have this uh, uh, um, uh, course that's coming up with uh, Harvard and Google uh, where we have already 16,000 people signed up and uh, Reno is going to be used there. Uh, there's uh, adoption going on in various universities, University of Minnesota, uh, lots of interest from others. Uh, we have a local university, plus University of Technology, uh, doing a course in collaboration with ST where, uh, um, you know, they had this problem that they couldn't access the boards. Students couldn't get access to physical boards for classes, so we just made them available via Renode. Uh, that was a pretty cool uh, uh, um, showcase of how a simulation can kind of solve logistical problems in, in education. We have this uh, project that's also happening right now called Vedliot or Vedliot, I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, it's basically a uh, European project where uh, we're building a scalable and deep learning focused platform. Um, and one of the backends will be FPGA based where we'll be in charge of building the RISC-V infrastructure, the, the core and the peripherals working in it and Renode in general will be used as the simulation platform for that. Uh, this project is just starting, but I think it'll reinforce this uh, use case quite a bit. Inside the project, we'll also be working with the custom function, you know, the custom acceleration uh, capability of RISC-V on FPGA and developing that standard and trying to think of practical use cases and improving it for those practical use cases. All right, so on to uh, how Renode's used in, in a more kind of 
you know, not just in the interactive scenario that you might just use it yourself to run things, but like more in the a broad scale. Um, so Reno's uh, very much focused on this flow where you'd be working on your own computer, that's the darkened box, but like the, the general context is you working in a company environment and having a server and having, you know, tests and, and teams of people working together where uh, having simulation just eliminates that problem of, of physical incompatibility of hardware and the logistics challenges. And uh, there is, of course, uh, much to be said about how you can use Reno and CI. We have many examples today. Uh, one of them here is, is this is a, a Travis based CI. Travis is perhaps not, you know, kind of going away a little bit, uh, but we have a lot of GitHub uh, actions examples too. Uh, nothing stopping you from using Jenkins or GitLab or whatever else you want to do. Um, we have a metrics analyzer, like a, a framework for analyzing how your binary runs and uh, how many instructions you're executing and how, how you're accessing memory, uh, what kind of peripherals you're accessing and when, and what are the exceptions generated. And uh, this you can do both in like real time. I, that's one thing that I didn't say about perhaps, but Reno has this virtual time front flow, which allows you to have determinism and repeatability uh, because you have this abstraction over the time flow in the framework. So you can have measurements in the virtual time, which give you repeatability. You can kind of measure and, and check those metrics and improve them. Uh, you can also do real time, of course, because you might be interested how, how this maps onto real world performance on your host computer. Uh, but of course, that's kind of less that's perhaps more if you're interested in how to just speed up your simulation, uh, but it doesn't have anything to do with the quality of your algorithm, um, or at least it's not directly related. And we, for example, had an MSc, uh, as I mentioned, there's a lot of use in education, an MSc uh, concerned with improving, you know, uh, uh, CNN model architectures without instrumenting code. So you just run stuff in TF Lite, but without uh, uh, having to change your code to extract that data. And you can use that data to then see whether you're you know, going forward or, or backwards. Uh, and you can experiment also even with like non-existing platforms, right? You want to see whether your algorithm would actually benefit from a platform that has more memory. Just build a bigger model, like increase your memory even though the real board doesn't exist but perhaps you're gonna get better results. That means that perhaps you should wait for an next-gen platform or push your vendor to, to, you know, to build a variant of your board that has more memory or do some other kind of optimization that you haven't thought of before. But the ability to kind of flexibly manipulate your platform uh, without actually having to change your code is, is pretty powerful. Um, we're doing a lot of work around also kind of making this, uh, enabling those kind of standard flows that people use. Colab is one of them, or Jupyter Notebooks in general. Uh, we have example Jupyter Notebooks. This one is about, you know, person detection. You can kind of do a flow where you capture an image from your camera, webcam on your computer, and then you can run this image through a virtual, you know, network running on simulated hardware. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, Arduino Nano uh, 33 BLE board from Nordic, um, and and uh, you can get also some some nice uh, uh, graphs here, charts of you know how many uh, instructions were used, and uh, let me just make this bigger for myself. Yeah, so so actually this is reason writes to memory, but you can get all those other metrics too. So yeah, the collab stuff is pretty exciting because you know um, basically uh, it's a fantastic tool for presentation. It's popular among researchers and students. You don't have to convince people to use it; they're already using it. And you can put this virtual hardware in front of them and tell them, "Hey, look! Like you don't need a board. Just go and do this in a notebook and see the results." And Google provides the compute power to also kind of make it work in the cloud. Um, and working together with Google, of course, is pretty useful here too. Uh, this, this way of working will also be used in this edX course I mentioned. And we're also maintaining a repository of collabs uh, that showcase different things uh, with TFLight. Uh, two things that my team wanted me to mention, and I think is this really awesome, is uh, the ability to support you know, custom instructions very easily. Uh, this is very useful in our work in Core 5 MCU because uh, CV32E40P, as they very conveniently call it, um, is this um, platform coming from ETH Zurich that has a lot of custom extensions, right? So 
uh, what do you do? Do you kind of implement this uh, paste paste thinkingly in you know code? Um, well, we normally do it differently. We just uh, build those uh, custom instructions with patterns and uh, very terse and concise handlers, and 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 basically in a few lines of code you have you know the entire implementation of a specific instruction going on, and this is also very useful for like prototyping of machine learning acceleration. Um, it's a very flexible uh, um, ability uh, that gives you, you know, the ability to prototype things first. If you really want to then create more advanced implementations and, and do some more detailed uh, stuff, you can still do that. But just for quick prototyping and seeing how's my, how's this crazy idea going to work out, it might be just two lines of code. Uh, and similarly, we have... Uh, uh, ability to add, you know, Python hooks that you can just inside a Renode script, you can put uh, specific hooks that just get called uh, on various events. And since you have access to all the details of your CPU, you can really do pretty crazy stuff. Um, this is, you know, uh, pretty extreme uh, and, and perhaps a bit advanced usage of Renode. But if you're actually doing, you know, machine learning development, if you're building RISC-V implementations, you're already probably doing pretty advanced stuff. So uh, this is just so much faster. Uh, and then, of course, once you hit the, the nail on the head, once you find the right combo of what you wanted to do, perhaps you can even go and implement that in your real world HDL design. Uh, we've had teams like Dover Microsystems actually developing Renault first and just building the things they wanted. And then once they found the right like uh, a combo, they went and developed the hardware. No, no earlier, right? They didn't actually do the hardware first. They built the simulation first, and only then uh, they built the hardware. We have stuff as well, like uh, uh, um, testing. Uh, basically, this is a public testing uh, dashboard where we test different uh, uh, binaries, different softwares. We compile them and run them in Reno to see if they keep working. Uh, we have um, a, um, public results of CIs that we kind of uh, run. This is actually the, the Reno CI um, that you can just view online. Uh, we have nice, of course, log viewers that you can use to, to take a look at whether your thing executed correctly. Uh, in general, there's a lot of infrastructure work that we're doing right now to, to kind of build uh, a more convenient you know, CI experience. Right, so hopefully I've told you quite a lot about interesting things now, what, what you can do next with that. Uh, first, um, there's some ongoing developments that uh, it's it's just good to follow them. Uh, um, and some of them are, of course, a bit more ARM focused, <laughs> but it's also useful given the fact that, you know, uh, even our ARM based development, uh, we do a lot of, you know, sensors and IO that eventually kind of uh, gets used as well in the RISC-V world. Uh, one big platform that we focus on right now is the Arduino Nano 33 BLE Sense. Uh, and we're doing quite a lot of work there, including video. We can actually input data to a virtual camera. Um, and that one's going to be used in the Harvard 10 ML course. Uh, and we're also adding a lot of support for the, you know, for the Core 5, for, for other boards, uh, for sensors. Um, and generally speaking, we're helping the TF Lite micro team adopt Renode-based CI. Uh, and that's kind of, I think, the, the most exciting part, but that has less, you know, uh, least visible, but like most exciting, because we're going to make their CI actually test whether things are breaking or improving, uh, which, of course, wasn't there before, uh, which was a major challenge. And we're doing a lot of work for, for education and collabs and all this kind of user-facing stuff that uh, is very nice to have. If you want to work with us, just come to us and, and help. we can help you know, build your CI machine learning pipelines. We can help you implement practical machine learning and just, just adopt this new approach to development and, and build RISC-V and FPGA-based stuff uh, in a like hardware software code design context. Um, and if you just wanted to not to talk to us, but rather just get started with Reno, there's many ways to do this. Uh, there's packages for various operating systems. There's Docker, there's Conda. Uh, there's even portable Reno. So you can just grab a package and just get running on your on your Linux machine immediately uh, without any dependencies. So, so that's an option too.
And with that, yeah, I, I finished my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Uh, great presentation and good to have an update on quite where Renode's going these days. Um, we'll take a couple of questions while um, uh, the next talk speakers get ready. I'm guessing that uh, Ari is going to be the next speaker up. Uh, any questions for Michael? Uh, Michael, I'm always curious because I, I, I've never got to ask you what sort of when you're using um, Reno to model a Risk Five processor, what sort of performance are you getting for the processor on a typical um, laptop or server? How fast does it really go? That, that is a very uh, uh, typical and, and common question, uh, and of course the, the answer is always it depends. But uh, you, you, you let, we're aiming for people to be able to work like they would with their real board. And hopefully faster even, but like depending on the software you're running, right? If you're sleeping all the time, we can cheat and we can just omit the time you're sleeping. If you're counting things all the time, this is binary translation, right? This is uh, more or less like QMU. So you can imagine like if something's very CPU intensive, it's going to be hard to simulate. But if something's uh, um, not doing much, like booting Linux, for example, you can do that in, and you can boot Linux. And I was talking about microcontrollers mostly, but you can boot Linux in Renault, and it'll take you know half a minute, not not half an hour, right? That's basically That's how you should look at it. Your your QAMU sort of category, not not yep. very later category. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. I don't see any other uh, questions coming in, so thank you very much. Michael, there'll be a brief pause while 